Joining us now, great to welcome a woman who's written a really interesting book, getting a lot of great uh, media just came out. It's called uh, Louisa, the Extraordinary Life of Mrs. Adams, talking about uh, Mrs. John Quincy Adams, and we're joined by the author. Uh, incidentally, her name is also Louisa, Louisa Thomas, on the telephone today. Louisa, good to talk with you. How are you? Thanks so much for having me on. You, you didn't write the book because of that, that say, you share the same name, though, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> it just um, worked I, out that way. Yeah, it is true that I might not have noticed her quite so quickly had she been named, you know, Jane. But it's an it's a uncommon name. It's a nice name. It's an uncommon name. So you probably don't meet too many other Louises. Uh, in it's true. Today. Well, one of my best friends is named Louisa, so we have that <laughs> in common. We have a little club. Um, yeah, I know. I don't think it extends too far beyond that. But um, it's funny when we were trying to figure out a title for the book. My editor kept, and I kept going back and forth. It's actually a very hard the title and finally I was just, can't we just call it Louisa I mean that's crazy right <laughs> <You know? laughs> well it's interesting kind of when you go back you know, there's been books written about other first ladies like you know Mrs. Lincoln and of course uh, you know the Kennedys and, and all that but but not too many books uh, if any have been written about first ladies of, of that era right the early uh, early parts of the country early time of the country I should say no yeah she's um she's been overlooked um, for a long time. That was a little bit of her own doing. It was partly because um, she herself kind of denied her own importance quite a bit. She even wrote, uh, titled one of her memoir sketches, The Adventures of a Nobody. Um, so, which is, gives you some sense of, of how she framed herself. Of course, she also wrote memoir sketches and describe them as having adventures. So, you know, so that tension characterizes so much of her. What, what made her interesting to you at this time to, to write the book? Well, I was really struck by her voice. I came across some of her letters while doing some research about Andrew Jackson, and they were vivid, and they were funny, and they were interesting, they were human. They were just absolutely different than everything else I was reading. And I thought to myself, who is this other Louisa, and why don't I know anything about her? I guess there wasn't a lot written back then, right? Where, where do you do the research on, uh, on someone like that? I guess, is there a library of, uh, you know, John Quincy Adams library or something? The Massachusetts Historical Society um, has 608 reels of microfilm oh, okay. um, on the Adams Family Papers, so you are just drowning in material. I mean, it's such a gift for researchers, and she wrote a tremendous amount. I mean, I really wanted to get as much of her voice into this book as possible without kind of, you know, overwhelming you with it. Um, so she wrote letters, she wrote plays, she wrote fiction, she wrote um, memoirs, she wrote journals. She she really kind of um, became a writer in a lot of ways. So that was the core of the research. Uh, then there are, you know, the detective work that requires looking at parish journals, and land tax records and things like that. Um, there's the letters of people running around her. You know, there's a lot of scholarship done about the period um, that I drew upon. So, yeah, there was, it was a huge research project and I was felt very lucky to have um, the access um, and the kind of materials that I did. But what makes her unique is she's the only foreign-born uh, first lady up to, up to today. That's right. That may change in November, who knows. But, uh, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but, but she's the only one, right? Yeah. She is the only one so far. And that, that's also part of her story. You know, she was at once an American and not. And that could be kind of difficult, but it was also sort of liberating. You know, it kind of gave her an outsider's perspective, which helped her find, you know, certain insights. What was she to uh, come from a family that uh, that was you know upper crust? I guess is the, maybe the term to use. I mean, uh, well to do, or how, how did she get uh, to meet John Quincy Adams? Well, she, her father was a, a wealthy, at least in appearances, um, American merchant living in London. Um, her mother was English. Um, her father was actually appointed the American consul by Thomas Jefferson, and his house was known to be very welcoming to Americans. You know, they would come pick up their mail, they would sit for dinner. John Quincy Adams was a diplomat at The Hague at the time, and he came over from London on a diplomatic errand and uh, came to dinner at the Johnson's house, so many Americans passing through did. Um, a couple of weeks later, he came back and basically never left. <laughs> um, he wasn't planning on uh, finding a wife, but one sort of, he kind of couldn't help himself. Was she, uh, I guess, you know, so early on in our uh, history, but was she considered uh, a successful first lady or a popular first lady? I guess it's hard to tell. There wasn't a lot of media then of the newspapers, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was this, I mean, the whole kind of stakes were different. Um, so one thing that is interesting about both their lives and careers is that the White House was not, um, 
their best period. John Quincy Adams struggled a lot. He was frustrated by Congress. He entered the House um, under a disapproval, and already the Jackson faction was um, working against him, you know, crying with calls of corrupt bargain with Henry Clay, that he'd had a fraudulent, you know, victory and things like that, and um, it was a pretty nasty time, and he was thwarted in a lot of ways. It was a one-term presidency, and she was frustrated, too. Um, she'd done a lot um, to help him gain the presidency. She had really... Um, she called it my campaign, you know, and she was really the social force. She understood that politics were about relationship. But once she got in the White House, she didn't really have a lot to do. I mean, there wasn't a lot of precedent before her, and the Elizabeth Monroe, who had come right before her, had been especially reserved and retiring, and she fo sort of followed her example, which meant she sort of spent a lot of time in her room uh, eating chocolate and translating French poetry and being very unhappy. It was a very hard time for her, um, and it was not like the campaign where she had thrived. She was married. They were married uh, almost 50 years, right? A good, a good marriage? They were more than 50 years. Tell? Yeah. A complicated marriage, um, characterized by tenderness, passion, support, and hostility, and even a period really in the White House of estrangement. Um, so I think that... It's, it was a real marriage. Um, you know, I don't idealize it. I think it was uh, hard at times, but at times really, um, you know, really a real marriage. They really depended on each other, and they, they learned from each other, and they, they grew together. Did you learn anything maybe you didn't expect, uh, you know, when you started the project uh, at the beginning that kind of surprised you about her? Uh, about her? I mean, I was really struck by her sense of humor, um, which I, we don't think of historical figures as being particularly funny, I think, especially kind right. of that far back, <laughs> sort of have these serious portraits. Um, and she sort of did that. She humanized the whole period. You know, no one she met was above her kind of, her, her you know, sharp pen. Um, and she gave the whole, she gave the whole period this kind of wonderfully, um, uh, how do I put it? She made nothing seem settled. Everything was in formation. Everything was kind of not taken too seriously. She sort of made it seem as dynamic a period as it actually was. And so to see it through her eyes was just so illuminating and, and exciting. She probably would have been a popular first lady today with, with media. Do you think she would have been Yeah, I think she would have. She would have been a good canny. Um, she would have been She would have been good. Well, it's a fascinating uh, story, a fascinating book about Louisa Adams, the wife of uh, President John Quincy Adams. We're talking with uh, Louisa Thomas today about the book. And uh, you have a website, Louisa, can you get more information on it? LouisaThomas.com. That's easy, easy enough. Easy to remember. <laughs> yeah. Well, pleasure talking to you. It's a, it's a great idea for a book. Please let us know when uh, your next project comes out. We'll have you on then. But thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm Stan Brock. Thirty years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas. But then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together, we can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids right here at home in the United States of America. If you'd like to order the book we're talking about, please go to DougMilesMedia.com and enter the author's name in the Amazon search box. Thank you for listening. Please come back soon for more conversations here at DougMilesMedia.com. This has been a presentation of Doug Miles Media, all rights reserved. You can listen to or download previous programs at iTunes, Stitcher.com, or DougMilesMedia.com.